Okay, so our first session of the afternoon is a discussion with our wonderful advising deans about how the Office of Undergraduate Studies works with parents and students as part of the student experience. So I'd now like to turn the dean, oh, the dean, <laughs> the stage over to the deans. Hi, my name is Robin Olinsky, and I am one of the Associate Deans of Undergraduate Advising. Um, our plan for this morning is for each of us to introduce ourselves, and we're each going to review um, some of what our office does to support students and to support you, um, as well as some of our academic requirements. And then in the second part of our session, we'll open it up to questions that you may have about your student's academic experience. Um, so again, I'm Robin. My advising portfolio is the end of the alphabet, so liberal arts students whose last names begin with P through Z, as well as the BA portion of our combined degree students experience. Hi everybody, my name is Leah Gad. I'm the advising dean for the SMFA, so I oversee um, all last names, A through Z, on the uh, SMFA campus, and I share uh, the combined degrees with Robin. Hi, everyone. I'm Kendra Barber, and I'm one of the liberal arts advising deans, and I have the beginning of the alphabet, A through G. Um, hi, I'm Jennifer Steven. I am the advising dean for all engineers, the entire alphabet. Uh, so if your student is an engineer, um, someone they should get to know. I also advise ROTC students, if you have a student who's in ROTC. And perhaps we should say something about our fifth colleague, um, Dean Carol Baffy Dugan, who can't join us today. She is the third of the three liberal arts advising deans. She has the middle of the alphabet H through O, and she also is, um, oversees pre-health advising uh, as well. Great, so our plan um, to start off with today is for Jennifer to share some information with all of you about our advising structure and the advising resources available to students. I'm gonna advance the slides while you get started. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so here at Tufts, uh, your child has a number of resources for getting academic advising. Uh, their advising dean, um, whichever um, school and program that they are in, as we just described, and also an academic advisor or a mentor, um, depending on which program they're in. If they are in a BA or BS program in either the School of Engineering or the School of uh, Arts and Sciences, they have a faculty advisor who's called a pre-major advisor who will work with them. Um, and the Pre-major advisor in the School of Engineering is always a faculty member in the School of Arts and Sciences. Most are faculty members, but not all. There are other advising professionals that take on that role. If your student is a BFA student, um, since there are no majors in the BFA program, a pre-major advisor wouldn't make sense. Instead, they have a faculty member who acts as a mentor to them. So again, um, your child will have two people they can work with. One their pre-major advisor or faculty mentor if they're a BFA student, and then their advising dean. And we partner together to support your student. And there's no right or wrong person that your child can go to. If they need help, they should go to one or the other. We know how to connect with each other and to connect your student to resources on campus. Um, so to think about our role, um, the faculty member or the mentor uh, or pre-major advisor that works with your student often has a lot of expertise about their discipline, academic discipline, whether it be in fine art or in engineering or in arts and sciences, and can really provide many detailed answers to questions about the field, the discipline, particular departments perhaps, um, in, if that's uh, uh, applicable. Um, after your student declares their major, which would be in the March 1st of the first year, if you're an engineer, or March 1st of the second year, if you're a BA or BS student in the School of Arts and Sciences, then the student gets a major advisor to replace the pre-major advisor. Very often that individual can stay the same, if appropriate. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, depending on the major in which the student declares. But the advising dean is a consistent advising relationship through all four years. 
And so outside of the, um, our role as advising deans is to really um, provide guidance on, th on things that uh, transcend a specific discipline or major, um, uh, you know, the major advisor or pre-major advisor might be the, the best resource for, let's say, electrical engineering internships or, but I would be a better resource for things that are not perhaps in this case electrical engineering specific. We support students on things that impact a student's academics, which as you know, because you're parents and you have had a lot of experience with your children, is everything. So we can support students on many, many things that the faculty advisor, pre-major advisor, or mentor, it's not really their, their um, role. We can support students on learning differences, on um, academic challenges, on, um, uh, helping think through choosing a major, perhaps uh, if they become ill, we are great, we are the resource for them to connect with. That's something you can tell your student. Um, we can connect them to all different um, uh, offices and colleagues on campus if we are unable to answer a question. We're a perfect um, place to start. So one way to think about us, if you will, is resource referral. We know who to connect a student to if they need support, um, and we're not able to provide that specific support. And I think that might cover the basis. Is that, yeah? Okay, great. Great, so Leah is gonna take a minute uh, to talk now about FERPA, and as well as our role in regards to supporting you in your efforts to support your students here and how parents can interact best with our offices. So I'll start with um, sort of who is your main contact for your student's academic life while they're at Tufts University, and it is us on this stage. So if you have questions about sort of degree requirements, how your student is doing, um, we would serve as the liaison to other university offices. And so I'm gonna encourage you to reach out to us um, if you have questions or concerns. The big caveat to this, um, <clears throat> and some of you may have attended our panel during orientation, so forgive me if this is uh, repeated information, is that there are um, privacy laws established by the federal government that guide sort of how we interact with any third party um, as it pertains to a student's academic record. And that is really anything concerning your student's academic life here. Um, you for better or for worse, are considered a third party. <laughs> we are really excited that you're here, that you're involved in supporting your student and during their academic journey, um, but there are limits to what we can talk to you about the specifics regarding your student's academic life. We need their explicit permission to tell you anything specific, even the classes they're taking. Um, and this uh, is federal law. Uh, if we violate this federal law, we stand to lose our ability to participate in federal aid programs. That would be pretty significant. Um, but I also think that there's a real educational value to this law because what this time is beyond them learning a lot of amazing things in the classroom is an opportunity within a safe space to start learning how to be an adult and how to negotiate the many bureaucracies and processes that they're gonna have to be negotiating for the rest of their lives. And we really see you as partners in this endeavor. So you can help us support them by empowering them to take charge of their academic life here. Um, so certainly, do not ever hesitate to be in touch with us if you have general questions about how things work at the university. Um, with that said, if you have specifics like, why did my student fail a class? Um, <laughs> we can certainly, we will speak generally to you about reasons why we find that students are not succeeding academically. We can talk about strategies, about how to support your student in getting back on track. Um, but in terms of those nitty gritty details of sort of the whys, what they're doing here, um, there are limits on what we can do. And even if in cases where your student gives you permission to have access to your record, and I like to talk about that negotiating between you and your student as you're entering into somewhat of a contract with your student, right? 
Many of you may be helping support them financially for school. We really appreciate that. Um, but if you want to make sort of a requirement of signing the check or you know putting some money in their bank account that they give you access to their, their record, that is definitely a conversation you can have between you and your student. That is not a conversation that we will negotiate for you between you and your students. <laughs> Um, so I'd really encourage you to first start with your student. Ask them questions. They're generally going to come to you in times where they're struggling. It is going to seem like everything is wrong here because you're their parents. They're comfortable sort of unloading on you. Ask them questions about what's going right <laughs> um, and reassure them that this is a really safe space to make mistakes, even fail. Um, that we can help them recover, but them communicating with all of us consistently is gonna be really essential to their success. Um, I'm happy to answer sort of more detailed, nuanced questions about FERPA during our Q&A section, but I think that that sort of gives a nice overview um, to our work with you as partners in supporting your students. Great, thank you. Um, so Kendra is now gonna talk a little bit about how we support faculty and the work that we do with faculty um, and how that relates to your student and to you as well. Okay, so I have a pop quiz. I wanna make sure everyone is listening. Um, so you just heard Leah talk about our roles. Uh, who is your first point of contact if you have any academic questions regarding your student? All of you get A's. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, us. So um, that means that something that is going to be very different from when your students were in high school is that you are not the person who will directly contact your students' faculty members. That's our role. So as advising deans, we support students. We also help support you as parents. But there's this other party there, the faculty, and we help support them as well. So we're doing all kinds of supporting around here. <laughs> um, and so, yes, so whenever there's something that comes up, um, the best thing for you to do if you have any concern is to contact us, and then we will connect with the student and the faculty member as appropriate. So when do we get in touch with faculty as advising deans? Um, there are a couple different times that we do that, so one is perhaps there's something happening with the physical health of your student. Um, maybe they have mono, or maybe um, they need to have surgery, or um, you know, maybe they have a concussion. Um, we partner with a lot of other offices on campus, and so if, you, if you're a student, if they're ill, please direct them to go to health service, plug for health service. Um, please direct them to go there, because if the student is actually going to be significantly um, ill for several days and it's going to impact their academic work, health service will actually connect with that student's advising dean and then we will immediately connect with the student and their faculty. Um, so that's another reason to absolutely, you know, recommend that your students go to visit um, health service if they are sick. Um, if there's unfortunately any kind of death in the family, um, all the student has to do is let us know and we will connect with the student's instructors to let them know that um, either you know, they need to travel at this time, or perhaps maybe they're not able to travel or anything, but they may need a bit of flexibility because it's a difficult time for them. Um, so we do that as well. Um, if there are any kind of first time mental health concerns, which sometimes arise, um, so this is not, you know, I, poor time management kind of a situation. Um, this is a, you know, perhaps the student is you know, experiencing a period of depression or something and it's kind of the first time this is happening, we will connect with the faculty in an appropriate way. And another reason why it's best for the advising dean to do that is because we know how to share the appropriate information with the faculty while respecting the student's privacy. Um, we don't want you to contact them and kind of give information about their, their medical diagnosis and things like that because that's really not information that the faculty need to know. Um, so when we contact faculty, what we're doing is we're requesting flexibility. So flexibility is not an accommodation. Sometimes people use the word accommodation and flexibility interchangeably. An accommodation is something that is specifically through student accessibility services. And 
when a student has that and they're registered through student accessibility services and they're given accommodations, faculty have to adhere to the student's accommodations. Um, flexibility is a yes or no. We are simply asking the faculty, you know, here is the, situ here is the situation with the student. Um, is there something that we can work out here? Would an extension be appropriate? Um, is this an absence that can be excused? And at the end of the day, it is at the faculty's discretion. But because they know that the students are connected with us and they understand the role that we play, they know that when we're asking for something, it's not minor. And so that's another reason why it's very important to have your student connect with us so that we can connect with the faculty member. Now, that being said, that does not mean that just because we ask for something or just because your student asks for something that they are going to get it, right? So connecting with us and saying, I need an extension on all my papers this week because of X, Y, or Z, um, doesn't mean that we're automatically going to make that happen. Sometimes that's the opportunity for us to have a bigger conversation with the student, and then we can talk about, okay, here's something that I can connect with your faculty about, um, but let's also talk about this and let's get you connected to the appropriate resources for that. Um, so at the end of the day, our goal is you know, to always work with students and faculty to develop a long-term sustainable plan, right? We don't wanna just slap a Band-Aid on everything and every time someone comes, yeah, you get an extension, yep, yeah, you get a makeup, yes, you get that. Um, but we wanna make sure that you know we are not overburdening faculty, but we're also being supportive of students and making sure that we're keeping their health and wellness at the forefront of things and making sure that they're also developing skills for when things get difficult. How do you connect to resources? How do you, you know, push through? Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to start us off by giving you a little bit of information about our degree requirements. Um, so I'm going to talk about some general degree requirements that pertain to students across all of our degree programs, and then we'll move into more specifics for students in the School of Engineering and students um, who are earning degrees at the SMFA. Um, the Go script that you see here, go.tufts.edu slash advising, will bring you to this page that has some of our best academic um, information, and this is the information we share with students. Um, so this is a great um, launch point for you if you are kind of struggling with what types of questions to ask your students, if you're seeing them for the first time this weekend since the semester started, um, or just trying to get some more substantive information from them about how it's going in their classes. I think familiarizing yourself with these requirements and how we talk about degree requirements here um, could really give you some insight into how your student is doing and the kind of progress they're making. So the first requirement that I want to talk with you about today is the residence requirement. So all of our undergraduate students and all of our degree programs should anticipate being at Tufts for eight semesters of full-time study. Um, so all students need eight semesters in order to graduate. This can also include our Tufts abroad programs and our external study abroad programs. Um, but we do require students to earn their degrees to be enrolled as a full-time student for eight semesters. Um, the BA and BS requirements for students in the School of Arts and Sciences have several different categories. So we have foundation, distribution, and major requirements. Foundation requirements are just that a foundation to their liberal arts education here at Tufts. It includes two semesters of writing. This also includes a world civilization requirement and our six semester extensive language and culture requirement. So those are considered our foundation requirements. Um, distribution requirements ensure that all of our BA and BS students are taking courses across a wide range of academic disciplines. So they're divided by discipline arts, humanities, social science, natural science, and math. Students are required to take courses across all of those. Um, and then a student also has requirements for their major. Um, students only need one of those to graduate. Um, it is a very strong uh, cultural 
thing here at Tufts for students to collect multiple majors and multiple majors and minors even. Um, one of the things that we do in our work with students is really help them to focus on what it is that they're interested in doing and creating opportunities for them to really get some depth in those areas. And if it makes sense to partner that with a second major, we will support them in that. Um, but students are not required to be um, having more than one major or multiple minors. Um, so that's something that we spend a lot of time talking with our sophomore students about as they get ready to declare their major. Um, you know, how can we identify one or two things that you're interested in instead of trying to do all of the things? Jennifer, do you want to talk a little bit about engineering requirements? Sure, definitely. Uh, so the requirements in the School of Engineering are quite different from those in the BA and BS program. Uh, as you might expect, uh, they involve a lot of math and science, and um, uh, the curriculum is more rigid than in the School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, generally, students can expect to take a, a number of intro math and science classes that are school-wide requirements that include Calc 1, Calc 2, Calc 3, differential equations, uh, physics, chem, et cetera. Uh, there is an intro engineering course requirement, an intro to computation um, requirement, uh, a specific course called ES2. And there is also a set of foundational requirements that every major has. Uh, and they do vary from major to major, but include general science uh, engineering, um, math, probability and statistics, fluid statics, um, mechanic dynamic, uh, fluid dynamics, statics, um, mechanics uh, are some examples. Intro to electronics, another example. And then there are about 10 courses for each major. Um, and those are specific to the discipline, electrical engineering or biomedical engineering and the like. So on, uh, basically, students take a lot of math and science, and then they take about 10 courses for their major. There are also 18 credits required in humanities and social sciences, and there are one or two free elective requirements in the School of Engineering. There are six departments in the School of Engineering and 17 degrees, but all of the degrees, um, with one or two small exceptions, uh, fit this general pattern of intro math and science foundational requirements, it's a bit more advanced math, science, and engineering, and then about 10 courses for the major and some humanities and arts and social sciences as well. And Leah's gonna talk a little bit about the requirements both for our BFA students and students who are earning combined degrees, BA and BFA. So on the opposite side of the spectrum from our School of Engineering is our BFA at the School of Museum of Fine Arts. Um, as uh, was mentioned before, we don't have majors in our school. It is a degree in studio art. Um, and so students are required over their time at the SMFA to complete 76 credits of studio coursework. What that studio coursework is is really totally up to them um, with a lot of guidance and support from myself uh, and my advising team as well as faculty mentorship and our instructional faculty. Um, this is a real foundation of the SMFA in that we feel like we can't decide what is the appropriate curriculum for any developing artist, and they really need to forge that path on their own. Um, so that is sort of our equivalent of a major. Um, in addition to those 76 credits of studio art, um, they have to complete a number of courses across the distribution areas, very similar to their colleagues in the School of Arts and Sciences. Um, so that is a total of 14 courses, typically around 42 credits um, across a number of areas, and we refer to those as non-studio distribution courses. Um, we're very intentional about that language um, because because many of our students come to, the, to come to our program saying, well, I have to do, I mean, I want to do my studio, but then I have to do my academics. Um, we really want to impress upon them that because they are choosing to get a college degree in studio art, art is academic. <laughs> um, and so we want to sort of take away those, those boundaries that they have created, and we really see those non-studio distribution courses throughout the humanities, social sciences, science and technology, and art history as feeding their art practice as much as sort of their studio development. 
Our combined degrees sort of do a combination of the BABS requirements that uh, Robin spoke of, so those foundation, distribution, and major requirements for the BABS portion of their program. Um, they don't have to do their arts distribution because we feel like we introduce them to the arts through 76 credits of studio art plus 15 credits of art history. And Robin and I work very closely with our combined degree populations because it is a complicated program to sort of navigate and get the best mileage out of the coursework that they have to take on both campuses. Excellent. So this is meant to be a really brief overview of our degree requirements. There are a lot of policies and there's a lot of really kind of in the weeds information about courses and credits all linked through these websites. So we can certainly address some more specific questions in the Q&A, but I really strongly encourage you to take a look at some of this to get a better idea of what your student is being expected to do here in the classroom. Um, the last thing I want to do before we move into the Q&A is to give um, all four of us an opportunity to sort of give you our best strategies and advice that we have kind of collected from doing our jobs and working with students and families. Um, and we'll just kind of go down the line um, and then we'll jump into your questions after that. Um, so I, um, I'll start because I have the mic, um, we'll say I have a couple of different pieces of advice. One is that I would really encourage you to encourage your students to ask for help. There, you can't go anywhere on this campus without finding administrators and faculty and advisors and staff whose sole purpose here is to help your student navigate their experience. And that can be academic, it can be co-curricular, it could be with regard to their health and wellness. Um, but they need to ask. So if you could help us kind of encourage them by asking them who they've connected with this semester so far, what resources on campus have they identified that are useful for them. Um, we work really hard to sort of normalize the experience of asking for help and we really, we model that amongst ourselves um, when we're working with students and not sure how to handle certain situations, um, but if you want to ask them who they've connected with and how they've asked for help and how they've received support, that would be a great help. Um, we've also talked a lot about sort of the relationship between the parent and students and us, um, and I actually think some of my best advising moments with my students have been a true partnership with their families. There are a lot of student meetings that I have where we're calling in um, families, um, either in person to all sit down together or over the phone um, to sort of talk about what's going on with a student here to get everybody's insight into what we're seeing and what's happening and to collectively problem solve the next steps. So I don't, I, I really want you to come away from today's session really seeing us as partners to work with you on supporting your student and making their experience here as positive as it can be. So don't hesitate to reach out to us, but there will be times when we will also reach out to you through your student and with your student to make sure that you're a part of the decision making as well. So I agree with all of Robin's advice. Um, I also think just letting your student know, I mean, asking them questions and being informed, um, but letting them know that things are gonna be hard and that's okay. Um, and that nothing that they really decide right at this moment, like a major, is gonna dictate necessarily the rest of their lives. I think it feels really high stakes. Like, I have to do this because I wanna do this, and that sort of chain. A lot of the work we do with students as well is sort of honing in on, let's talk about this moment. Um, I highlight that people change their minds all the time. Um, what you do in undergrad does not necessarily dictate um, what you're gonna do in grad school, what your career is gonna be, so that there's a lot of flexibility, that this is really a great opportunity to get a wide variety of intellectual and sort of human experience. It's a great time to sort of become an independent adult, um, but that there is a lot of opportunity to change. I refer to my dad regularly who sort of found two new careers in his mid-60s, has never been happier. Um, so folks can change their mind all the time and I would just reassure them that even though things are hard, can be hard, that that doesn't mean 
they're not going to be okay. Um, <clears throat> and just a little side piece of advice, if you email us, I would really ask you to include your student on that email. Um, and it will say that most of us, if you email us and don't, will include them on the reply. So <laughs> I would just ask you um, to keep them in the loop from the very beginning. Okay. I agree with everything that Robin and Leah said as well. <laughs> um, so I think my piece of advice, especially at this point in the semester where there are midterms, and if you all haven't figured out yet, um, it sounds like at Tufts almost everything is called a midterm. Um, so it's like <laughs> midterms from September and then it stretches through December and then it's finals. Um, and so at this point, you know, students are experiencing a lot of stress, which is normal, it's okay. Um, sometimes they have an exam and a paper in the same week or maybe in the same day and they're calling you and they're venting and they're like, oh my gosh, everything is the worst and I'm not sleeping because I'm up all night doing this work. How many of you have gotten those phone calls? Okay, a couple of you. Um, when you get those phone calls, I know sometimes your immediate reaction is to jump into fix it mode, because that's what you want to do. You want to make things easier and better for your, for your student. Who wants them to have a tough time, right? What parent wants that? Um, but when you feel yourself wanting to immediately intervene, whether that means wanting to jump in and email that student's instructors, which we've discussed, that's we're not gonna do that, right? We're gonna email the advising dean. Um, or whether, you know, maybe they're complaining about their roommate and you're gonna, you, you know, you feel like you should call, excuse me, call Res Life or something. Maybe start by just asking the student, you know, uh, okay, so, you know, sounds like things are a little stressful now, a little tough, you know, what's your plan? What do you, you know, what's your next steps? What resources can you access to handle this situation? Have you talked to anyone about it? Anyone besides me, I'm happy to listen. Um, but you know, make sure that you're empowering them. Start taking those steps because as Leah was saying, this is the place where like they can grow and start to become independent adults and build their resilience and make mistakes. Um, so your, your students are often far more resilient um, than you may initially realize. Um, so I, I guess my piece of advice, just to summarize, is when you feel the urge to immediately fix it, maybe start working on how can I empower my student to fix it themselves. So I have the hard job of being the last one at the end of the line when um, my dear colleagues have already imparted so much um, wisdom. But I will say I'm the only one uh, sitting on this stage who's a parent of college students. And um, so I will offer some advice from that perspective. Uh, other parents on the stage, but not quite um, at this um, point, not, not as old as my children. Um, and I just want to piggyback on a few things that were said here. There's been um, you know, a lot of conversation about encouraging um, uh, your student when they get in touch with you all agree with everything everyone said about um, being resilient and, uh, and uh, developing skills. Um, I do want to honor and recognize um, that not every student does turn to their parents for everything and that there are sometimes some problems that are, are um, too big for a student to handle. Um, and, you know, there are things that we can reasonably expect. So I find myself saying to, I have three daughters, saying to my daughters, that one's graduated from college, one's in college, and one's a, a junior in high school. Um, I find myself saying to them, this is a problem you can fix. You know, how are you going to fix it? But some problems are, are big problems, and, and they need support on. And um, to pick up um, something Leah said earlier in the sense that she made a reference to you're entering a contract with your child. Um, you know, I, I also encourage you to think about not just communicating with them clearly, like I'm paying the bill, I expect you to tell me what the grades are, but to let them know what you hope and expect in terms of their communicating with you. Um, I've been at Tufts for three years now, but I had a 21-year career at Wellesley College, and the number of um, women that I talked with at Wellesley who were experiencing hard things and told me that they weren't, weren't going to tell their parents, I mean, really big things that, as a mother, I would have wanted to know about my daughters, and I would say to them, 
you know, this is part of what your parents signed up for when they became your parent, right? Not just all the good grades and not just all the accolades, but helping you when things are hard. Um, and they would be afraid to perhaps disappoint you or worry you. And so my advice is if this resonates with you, every parent is different, but if you're sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, I would wanna know if something was really big happening to my child, make sure you tell them that, you know, I'm here, I can handle it. I am ready to help you if something serious does happen. I want, I want to be part of that, just like you want to know their grades as well. So I'm always encouraging students to, to, talk, to, their, to talk to their parents, especially when things are really particularly hard. Awesome, thank you. Lots of good advice here. And we'll keep reminding you and your students of all of these um, advice and strategies. Um, we, this is what we're doing all day long with your students, um, and, and we're happy to, to serve as a reminder for you as well. At this point, we do want to open um, up to questions. What I want to try to focus on are questions that are more broadly applicable to all of the families in the room. If you have specific questions about your students' AP scores, for instance, or study abroad plans, we are going to be available for a couple of minutes after the session in the lobby. We are also available tomorrow morning from 9 to 10 um, at the coffee hour, um, as well as by email. Um, so think about sort of the broader audience when you are asking your questions. Um, there's, we've got some helpful volunteers in the audience, um, so just raise your hand and we'll um, distribute the questions among us. Hi, this is for Leah. Um, for students that are in the dual degree program, to what degree um, do they rely on each other for these huge amounts of expression? Maybe it's for writers as well, but in the creative arts, uh, which is not necessarily something that you would grade or think. This is um, enormous uh, uh, free uh, license for expression, and to what degree do they rely on maybe upper class students to help them uh, navigate and sort? Definitely. Um, that's a great question. I think it's applicable to both our combined degrees and our BFAs. So many of you who have students at the SMFA hopefully know that we actually don't have letter grades in our studio classes. We're in a credit, no credit system. Um, that is also one of those sort of fundamental things about our pedagogy there in that uh, grading art, grading is pretty subjective, though maybe in Calc 1, a little more straightforward than in advanced painting. Um, but we really actually, at the SMFA, we talk a lot about success and failure. Um, is that failing out of your classes? No. Students can still not pass studio, um, and mostly it's because they don't go, so file that away. Um, <laughs> um, but I think that students, we have a very, um, a relatively small community on the SMFA campus. It is very close-knit. Um, the system of evaluation for studio <laughs> art is critique, and then something called a review board at the end of the semester if a student's carrying seven or more credits of studio coursework in any given semester. That is an opportunity to meet with two two faculty members and two peers um, and talk about their whole body of work from the semester. Um, it is a really amazing, unique opportunity where you get to look sort of holistically at your practice um, and it shifts depending on the student and depending on the year level and those conversations. Uh, students get a little overwhelmed by the prospect of that meeting. I really try to frame it for them as this is an opportunity for you to become a better artist um, and I actually challenge all of them during orientation to make bad art um, because that's how you make better art. Uh, if everything is a home run, what are you going to learn from that? And it's relatively subjective. Like, I may never like a certain color. That doesn't mean a painting made with that color is bad or good. Um, we are really focused on them becoming better, not the best. Um, so I think we really try to frame that in our classes, our faculty are really devoted to that, and peer mentorship um, in terms of feedback, they're living in the studios together, they're spending really intensive time with each other, um, so I think a lot of that cre like happens organically, um, and that, that alleviating that pressure of the letter grade within the studio context I think is really helpful for that. It's if you show up and you do the work and you're engaged, most likely you're gonna earn credit. It's when you don't show up, you're not engaged, 
um, and you're not pushing yourself, where that becomes tricky, usually we know about those things in advance. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, is it working? It's not working. Oh. I can't. Thank you. Thank you. If a student, it's still not working. Should I just yell? We can hear you. If a student is a freshman who's expressing some anxiety right now because their um, knowledge base, because they have a vast interest range and they don't know what they want to major in and they're showing, expressing anxiety in that, should they come to you? Does it just organically come up when they meet with you? Sure. So the question is for those of you in the back. Um, this is a first year student who is expressing some anxiety about not knowing what they want to major in and not feeling like they have a plan yet. Um, that is absolutely normal. And I think your student probably thinks they're the only one experiencing that right now. But that's a really common conversation that we have with students. Pre-major advisors are having with students. Faculty have with students. Students basically have four semesters worth of courses to use for trial and error in, in arts and sciences before identifying their majors. So we strongly encourage them to build schedules that balance things that sound interesting to them and sound engaging, things they already know they like, and r fulfilling requirements. For a student who is feeling really stressed out about um, kind of not knowing and not being able to narrow it down, our advice to them is going to be to take more classes and take different classes in the spring. They are just as likely to identify areas that they're interested in as they are to cross things off the list. So we kind of help them to see that sometimes there is some connection among the courses that they're choosing and that they have a clear sense of where they want to go. But I think some of the really good conversations that we have are when students can say, I don't like this thing. But this sounds like it could be interesting. And then we're talking with them about not just the majors, but what kinds of skills they want to come out of it, knowing what's important to them, um, what kind of work in the classroom they like to do. So we're going through a series of questions um, and encouraging them to try different classes and then come back to us with different ideas of possible majors. And we'll make suggestions and help them narrow it down. But it is very, very common source of anxiety for students. Um, and the real solution is to let it play out for a little bit longer. Um, yes, I agree with everything that Robin's saying. Um, I just wanted to add a couple things. Um, one of the ways that we have those conversations is by asking a lot of questions. What do you like, what are you not liking you know, about your classes? Um, another thing that I see come up when I have these conversations with students, um, and I will speak specifically from the liberal arts perspective since that's my population, um, is they will say, well, I think I'm interested in this, but like, what kind of job would I ever get by studying that thing? And, <laughs> and so often the conversation becomes, well, you know, that's not what we're trying to figure out right now. <laughs> we're not trying to determine like what your career is gonna be, you know, 20 years from now. But that's also um, a great time, and I believe you all will be hearing from Greg Victory after us. Um, but that's also another resource that we have students explore. It is never, ever, ever too early to go to, to the Career Center because part of what they do is help students with major exploration. Um, and often after speaking to the Career Center, students will realize that the five things that they thought one could do in life has expanded to like way more options or that because we are giving them a liberal arts education, their degree does not determine the thing that they are going to do with the rest of their life. So that's what I want to add. Yeah, I'll just say a little bit from the engineering perspective. Um, uh, most of engineers in their whole first year at Tufts take the same curriculum. There are some variations if there are some AP credits and maybe a student placed out a Calc 1 and starts with Calc 2. But by and large, the students are all taking virtually identical curriculum. They might have a different EN1 class. There are about uh, 12 flavors of intro to engineering, engineering and crisis, and intro to ro simple robotics. But it's an intro engineering class. And they all take math, they take science, they take English, and computing, as I described. So the message for any engineer who's stressing is it really doesn't matter. Because if you're all taking the same thing, what I mean is f freshman first semester being stressed about a major, it doesn't matter. There's, you have the whole first year that you're taking everything everyone else did. 
you know, you're all taking the same thing. So you can easily major in anything at that point. Um, yes, you'll declare a major on March 1st, but, and you'll sign up for classes after that, but really until you come back the following year, it, it, you have time to change your major and you have time to change your classes if you like. And even then, if you have settled and declared something, mechanical engineering, and then you decide after your third semester, when you started maybe taking your first MECI class, that you don't like it and you're more interested in biomedical engineering, um, that one MECI class or two classes that you're taking will be applicable for your BME degree or whatever the degree might be because of the foundational science and math that is required and the fact that there are some spaces in every degree to take an engineering course as opposed to a specific engineering course. So we can take that mechanical engineering course and just use it in that spot on the degree sheet. And I talk to students just like um, Kendra said about connecting with um, the Career Center for exploring with them um, what the different fields of engineering look like, but we have many, many resources too. We do during orientation and engineering student panel to students from every single major that talk about the major. That's been videotaped, is up on um, our uh, website. We have Engineering Week in the um, uh, spring, right before uh, registration for the following semester, which is a whole week of engineering activities for your student to learn about the different fields of engineering. If your student's an engineer but doesn't really know which discipline to major in, ask them if they're reading the Tufts engineering newsletter that drops in their email every week that tells all the activities that happen in the School of Engineering every week and ask them, you know, to go to one a week. Go hear a mechanical engineering speak. Go hear a working engineer speak. Go hear a professor in biomedical engineering speak. And this will help you over time sort through um, what the different fields are and gain information about them so that they feel more secure in declaring a major. Thank you, and forgive me if, if this subject was covered early on in the presentation. I appreciate that the student support model uh, relies on the student reaching out to various resources, including the, uh, the advising deans. But what about um, the student who is more reticent? Um, and it could be for any number of reasons. They are either too confident or they lack confidence, whatever. Um, are, there, are there opportunities or do you ever require p affirmative engagement with students um, to, to kind of push them out of their, uh, their torpor? I can start. Um, so in terms of checking in, depending on who your student's advisor is, and obviously it's a little bit different for each of our schools, um, they have to check in with someone each semester. Um, and they, the cookie that we hold for them uh, to encourage that checking in is registration. So they cannot register for classes until they meet with their advisor. Um, and right now we are, at, I'm right at the beginning of my advising period, it's a little bit longer um, than my colleagues, but we are diving into it next week. So that is happening now, good for you to know. Um, I think this is where families can actually be excellent partners is that you know um, through the resources we're providing for you all that's available for students um, and so encourage them regardless of whether they're saying things are doing great or not so great to connect um, and if they don't know where to go we are all a really great first stop because that is a lot of the work we do is sort of triaging and liaising to other places. Um, if a student is struggling, so a faculty is in contact with us about sort of low test grades, not showing up for class, we will reach out. Um, and then if there are reports sort of on the more co-curricular side that get to our Dean of Student Affairs Office colleagues, they will also reach out. There are moments that where we think students are struggling or in crisis where we sort of mandate that they come in and see us. So it's not that we put it all on them. Um, in general, if we don't know, we're not gonna reach out, but we have lots of mechanisms in place across the university to sort of loop us in when things aren't going in the greatest ways. Um, the other thing I'll say about that is that if you as a parent are concerned that your student isn't connecting with resources, I, 
um, field these kind of requests from families all the time where they're just, can you just check in and see how things are going? I'm not getting a ton of information. We all send emails to students and call students all the time and say, hey, just introducing myself. I'm your advising dean. Why don't you come in um, to meet with me? I'm excited to, to introduce myself and to learn about what you're doing here. So it's not unusual for us to do that, and we don't say, hey, your parents called and they're worried. Um, but we can frame it in a way that, like, hey, just pop into our office at some point. We're excited to hear how your semester is going. So there's lots of opportunities for us to get information if a student hasn't walked in and, and said they need help. Uh, and just to pick up, I always say to my students, um, whenever I have the opportunity to in whichever form or venue, and so please feel free to do this as well, is that we're not just here for problems. We are here for, we love to have more than problems, <laughs> believe me. Uh, it's nice to mix it up, to hear something good, to hear about some cool thing that happened, um, something they're proud of or excited about. So please ask, ask your student to, to, to be mindful of that. And on that note, if your student is an engineer, Tell them that I eat lunch every Friday, except when I'm here doing something like this from noon to one in the Kindleman Cafe over in the Science and Engineering Complex, and I'm just there to have lunch with. So they are welcome to stop by, look for me, sit down, introduce themselves. That could be intimidating, but it's not quite like, you know, going to the dean's office up in Dowling, and, you know, I'm, I'm just there having lunch with, you know, many other um, students and you know, staff and faculty also doing the same thing as well. So another opportunity just to try to connect. Um, well, Jennifer mentioned the positives, and I, I, I think that sometimes in our work, in our conversations with parents, we do kind of focus on what happens if something goes wrong, but our office can also serve as a really important connection point for enrichment opportunities. Um, the Office of Scholar Development is also linked from our office, so if your student is interested in doing research or, um, fellowships and scholarships for time, their time after Tufts, that also comes through us. We provide a pretty steady pipeline to the, the staff person in that role of students who are interested in some more opportunities outside of the classroom to engage in research and who are doing like really incredible things. So good stuff comes this way too. Yeah, um, I, th I think one way, another way to think about our role is that we're, ultimately our job is to help students graduate, um, hopefully on time, and achieve along the way their academic and personal goals, which sounds very lofty, but that's what we really aim to do. So if they're curious in, uh, you know, for exploring how they might study abroad um, as an engineer, that's absolutely something I love to have those conversations. If they want to take a, you know, a semester off to do a cool internship, I mean, these are all the types of things that we also support students on. So first of all, thank you for uh, being on the panel and making yourselves available for this Q&A. I guess it's not working. Can you, I don't, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. So what I'd like to understand is as the world continues to change and evolve, right? Study abroad is a relatively new thing, as an example. How would you say the field of advising for you has changed? How do you interact with the students differently now than so you would have a few years ago? So the question is, um, given sort of changes more broadly, globally, um, the question is how does our job as advisors and our work in advising change given sort of what's going on outside of Tufts? Um, I'll start. I think everybody probably has something to say. I mean, I think one of the biggest changes is right here, just the amount of... Um, parental involvement um, and a student's kind of level of expectation about how much support they're used to receiving from their families and how that's going to carry with them um, when they get here. I think that we try to be much more proactive in our work with families knowing that this is an expensive enterprise for you um, and the students are feeling pressured to get the most for their money. So how we talk to parents and how we support you as part of this process is something that has changed a lot over the years. Yeah, I think to sort of expand on that, uh, I think that in general, um, there's just like a higher feeling of things are really high stakes. 
um, which is understandable. It's, there's a lot of unknowns, uh, both within their sort of local environment, especially at the beginning of their academic careers, but the world at large. Um, and so I think for me, it's sort of trying to help students sort of refocus on that, like, let's break it up into manageable parts and sort of focus on the right now with an eye to the future, but like, we don't know what jobs we're preparing them for. Um, there's a lot of unknowns, so sort of making it feel, helping them make it more manageable for themselves in terms of chunking it out. When we back up and start thinking about that big picture, it gets really overwhelming. It's understandable that people are feeling anxious, and, um, but I do, I do think sort of helping break it up into those manageable parts is really a center of sort of my, my focus to advising. Yeah, um, I agree. I think that there's an increased pressure um, that students have, you know, as the cost of higher education rises, um, just like being concerned about getting a job and being successful, which certainly um, social media adds to that, <laughs> you know, comparing yourself to others and things like that. Um, so I, I, I think I see a heightened sense of pressure and anxiety, to keep it short. Um, I have a few thoughts. One is that, um, you know, today's student body is undoubtedly um, more, far more complex than when we went to school. Um, complex in terms of uh, where students come from, uh, geographically, what part of the world, um, socioeconomic class, diversity on, in every dimension, and um, including, um, you know, uh, students who in prior um, generations might not have made it uh, to a campus like Tufts because of all of the um, support that we now have for students with learning differences or managing anxiety or different mental health issues um, before they ever set foot on a college campus. So our work has become a lot more complex because we have a lot more diversity in our students. And um, so that was one of my responses. The other response specifically to piggyback on your question about international and global opportunities is, uh, you know, I'm an engineer by training. I have my bachelor's, master's, and PhD in electrical and computer engineering. And um, when I studied abroad, I was like a very rare creature to have done that. And I only studied things that had nothing to do with engineering. And so certainly in the field of engineering, um, there's been an evolution and a deep commitment um, here at Tufts um, to uh, think about making more international experiences available to um, our students um, in a cohesive, thoughtful way. So it's not a one-off from their degree, but rather it's integrated with their um, academic goals. And that also extends to things such as um, internships and co-ops. And so we actually now have um, piloted a co-op program in the biomedical engineering department, which is being extended to the computer science department. And these are both new things. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I've been heavily involved with advising the, the evolution of these things and helping students um, think really big and have big dreams about how they want to achieve their goals in a way that's different from traditional engineering. Well, actually, we need to stop our questions at this point, but as, thank you so much. This was a wonderful presentation.